Uh, so yes, about my new work in uh, uh, genome assemblies uh, and Chinese postman and virtual clusters, uh, which uh, is a hodgepodge of uh, several uh, Two completely unrelated things, but uh, I decided that uh, you know, given that the crowd here will, could be from every, absolutely every walk of life, not necessarily interested in bioinformatics per se, uh, I can uh, do something uh, a little bit uh, strange and uh, surprise you. So oop, let's skip the slide. So first, I want to uh, start with a one-slide introduction to biology, just in case uh, it's been a while since your high school biology class or when you took high school biology, they didn't know about DNA yet. Uh, so um, this is a uh, coming from the US Department of Energy, so it must be right. But uh, uh, the basic idea is that uh, your, um, uh, your body is made up of cells. So uh, is there a pointer? Thank you. Thank you. So your body is uh, made up of cells. And uh, these are the basic building blocks. And inside your, each of your cells, there is this thing called the chromosome, uh, or many of them, chromosomes. And chromosomes are DNA. That's the basic building, uh, that's the build basic code for all life, or at least all life that we know of. And DNA is this nice double-stranded helix, uh, which uh, has, pairs of letters which bond to each other. And uh, these base pairs, there are four of them, A, C, G, and T. And C always bonds to G, and A always bonds to T. And from this DNA, you make proteins. And proteins are the stuff which actually do things. They help your cells do what your cells do. They help you digest. They help you uh, uh, use your muscles. They help you um, have your communication with neurons, and so on. So in this talk, it's. Uh, on this biological front, we will talk about whole genome shotgun assembly and uh, whole genome shotgun sequencing. And that's the idea of how you figure out what the DNA looks like. So your genome, it's this really, really long molecule. It actually has 3 billion nucleotides or bases. And you want to figure out what it is. But we don't have technology which will actually take the DNA and tell you here are the letters in it. The technology that we do have, it's, it can sample really short pieces from the DNA and give you the sequence. So these sequences are called reads. So given a 3 billion long genome, we can get lots and lots of 500 long pieces. And you can see half of the pieces are red and half are blue. And this actually implies that they're coming from different sides of the DNA. Remember, DNA is a double-stranded helix. So there is one side, the red, and the other, the blue. And they're actually oriented opposite to each other. One's coming from this end, one's coming from that end. And uh, you can get all these pieces. And now the job of an assembly program, or of an assembler, is to build what the genome could have looked like. So this requires you to figure out which pieces of the DNA go together. And that's basically uh, sequence similarity, sequence alignment. And that's a pretty easy computational uh, job. I mean, just you, what you do is you throw lots of hardware at it, and uh, it all happens. And then once you have that, you need to lay them out and build a consensus sequence. So get the, what letter should be at every single position in the original genome. And there could be gaps. Like, there could be some areas where we didn't have any reads. So in that case, we won't have any sequence from there. And then biologists go in, and want, they, have, they have technology to basically attack a particular gap to get just a sequence from there. So the problems are unknown orientation. When you get a read, you don't know which side it's coming from. So people say DNA is a string. Well, no, it's not quite a string. It's a molecule, and you don't know which of the two strings of that DNA you're reading. There are sequencing errors. So when you get a piece of DNA, there could be some mistakes. Could be read a letter wrong. Uh, there could be incomplete coverage, which is this problem. And the, there are also these things called repeats. And those are what makes the assembly problem hard. So repeats are areas of DNA which appear over and over and over and over again, many, many times in the genome. And nobody is really sure what they do or why they're in the genome. There are some theories, but nothing concrete. The only thing we know is that they make assembly difficult. So in this talk, we will sort of take a very theoretical view of sequence assembly. And uh, the theoretical view 
starts with a definition. So what's our input? Is input a set of strings over A, C, G, and T. Output, it's a common superstring of all of these strings. So this is going to be a string which includes all of the other shorter strings. OK, so just as a simple example, so let's say we were given these three strings. This is a valid superstring. It uh, has TACAT in it, it has ACGTAC in it, and it's got CATAC in it. OK, so it turns out there are lots of superstrings. And which one do we want? Well, initially, people thought that they would want the shortest common superstring. So this is the shortest genome which would explain all of the strings that we have gotten. Well. There are two problems with it. And the first one is that it's NP-hard, which is sort of not necessarily any reason to quit. But um, uh, it uh, sort of makes theoretical people uneasy. But it can be solved using a traveling salesman problem solver. Or as I recently learned, the new, it's now called traveling salesperson problem. Uh, so here is uh, the, it can be done so using something called the overlap graph. And this is something I'll keep coming back to in the first half of the talk, graph theoretic models for sequence assembly. So in an overlap graph, so here let's go back to our example. We have A, C, G, T, A, C, and so on. The nodes of our graph will be these reads. So here they are. The edges are the overlaps. And all of the edge nodes overlap with all, all of the reads overlap with, overlap with all of the other reads. But the weights or the distances are the lengths of the prefix. Is how much do you have to go before you get an overlap? So for example, if you go from ACGTAC to TACAT, there are three letters at the beginning, ACG. So this is the weight, the distance on this edge. And, um, if TACAT to CATAC, you have to go two letters, and so on. So it turns out that the traveling salesman tour is exactly the shortest common superstring. Well, it's the shortest common circular superstring, but then you can do the usual trick of triangle pairs and get uh, the non-circular version. And usually, we'll, I'll, I'll talk about sort of circular paths, uh, so which will make just, it makes the algorithms easier. There is no conceptual difference. So this is the shortest sur traveling salesman tour. And it actually also corresponds to the shortest possible, uh, shortest common substring. Yeah? So why is the weight high from the bottommost to the topmost? Uh, because, so yeah, that's a good question. So here, ACGTAC. The way you can have ACGTAC followed by CATAC is to have the C letter in common. Uh, T-A-C-A-T does not overlap at all, I don't think, that one. So there are five letters which you have to go through before you can have that string. Right? So it's basically there is no overlap, which is, I mean, think of it, think of uh, there being a uh, special extra letter here, which is at the beginning and end of every string. So it's like a star here and a star there. There will be five letters which you go through before you hit the star, which uh, causes the overlap. So just yeah. no overlap is you know, the empty string is still a valid overlap from the theoretical perspective. So all right. So this is a you know the shortest common superstring. Uh, you can solve it using traveling salesman uh, sol TSP solvers, and there's lots of them, and you can actually be pretty successful at it. However, let's sort of take one step back and think: Do we really want the shortest common superstring, or something else? Well, let's go back. I said DNA is full of repeats. These are identical and nearly identical copies of segments of DNA that appear many times in the genome. Well, how many? Well, for example, the ALU repeat, it is 300 bases long, and it is present a million times or so in the human genome. So that's uh, quite a bit. Well, what would a shortest common superstring solution do to something like this? Well, 
It uh, actually puts it only once in the solution because these are identical copies. Best it knows, they don't, you don't really need them to have in the explanation. So they're only present once in the answer in the shortest common superstring. And there has been a lot of work uh, in the, over the past uh, 10 years or so on modeling the repeats explicitly in the framework, in the graph theoretic framework. And sort of the two approaches which I'll talk about are De Bruyne graphs and string graphs. Uh, this is work by Pevsner and his group, and this is work by Gene Myers. And um, the hope, to some extent, of all of these approaches has always been, well, maybe we can not only have a more accurate solution, but can we also make it tractable, polynomial time? And uh, so this has been sort of what they've been pushing, that our approaches hopefully will make the problem, since you're no, no longer looking for just something shortest, it will become in some way tractable. So let's first talk about De Bruyne graphs. And uh, this is a um, approach which was developed by Pavel Pevsner starting in 1989. Not the Bruyne graphs themselves, but the Bruyne graphs are older, but for sequence assembly. So the nodes will be something which we call a K minus one MERS. And uh, so a K MER is a K long piece of DNA, K long, K K -long string. So the nodes are K mi minus one MERS, and I guess that you would ask what are K MERS then. The edges are the K MERS, and this will make our life slightly simpler. And uh, just as a definition, that the set of all K MERS in the genome is called the K spectrum. So just as an example, this is a K spectrum. These are a set of K MERS which theoretically are present in some genome. And this is the De Bruyne graph. These are all of the K minus one MERS, so these are three MERS, these are two MERS, which are present in there. You get this kind of graph. Uh, the edges correspond to a three, so you have the TTC somewhere. So TT shows, has an arrow to TC. The letter T is shared, so totally together they spell TTC, and so on. So finding the shortest string with a given K spectrum is actually equivalent to Chinese Postman. This is Pevsner's result. So the Chinese Postman tour of a graph, which I'll get back to uh, slightly later on in the talk, is a tour which visits every edge at least once. So it's like Eulerian tour, but you're allowed to repeat edges. And uh, so this, so Pevsner showed that this problem can be solved for um, uh, strings with a given K spectrum. And um, then he sort of take, took his approach and started expanding it into De Bruyne graphs with walks. So what, what is this? So here now, let's say instead of having a uniform sampling, we have uh, just all three MERS. We have some three MERS and some longer strings. You can do the exact same trick. You can have your nodes as K minus one MERS and edges as K MERS. So you get the exact same graph. But now every single read, or everything longer than three letters, becomes a walk on this graph. And just as a, a syntactic point, a walk is different from a path in that it's allowed to repeat uh, notes. So the reads are the walks. So for example, the C-A-T-T -T path goes like this, C-A-T-T. -T. GCAG path goes like this, and uh, the ATTCA goes like this. And the problem in the De Bruyne graph approach is to find the shortest superwalk, and that's a walk that includes all of the input walks on the De Bruyne graph. And Pevsner sort of, he was optimistic when he published his 2001 paper that this problem could be done in polynomial time. He says that there is still a gap that he was not able to solve, but it actually, it, he showed that it's polynomial time if every edge is used exactly once, but not if it, you could use edges multiple times. And uh, sort of, the, he was really optimistic that this could be a polynomial time algorithm. Well, it turns out it's not. So De Bruyne, uh, superwalks on De Bruyne graphs are NP-hard for pretty much every single setting you can come up with. And it's a really simple reduction, actually, from shortest common superstring, which we started with. So 
given a set of strings over ACGT or any other alphabet, what we do is we add K special symbols. So K is the size of the kamer. And we, we use diamonds between all of the letters and before and after the string. So ACAC becomes diamond, diamond, A, diamond, diamond, C, so on, C, diamond, diamond. So this is a K times longer string. And since K is a constant, uh, this is still polynomial time and all good. And we make a De Bruyne graph with these. So now we actually, what we end up getting is cycles which correspond to all of the individual letters of the, of the alphabet. And a read is now a set of cycles, just this cycle and this. So for example, AC, AC will look like this. It's the cycle A followed by the cycle C followed by the cycle A followed by the cycle C. And it turns out that any super strength of length L in the original becomes a super walk of length L times K plus one in this graph. And this is pretty easy to verify. Uh, so for any super walk is obviously some kind of walk in this graph of exactly k, times long, k plus 1 times longer, because we inserted k extra nodes on every single cycle. And um, the other way is also you know, it's easy, pretty easy to verify. At every single, no matter how you visit them, you just get some kind of super walk as long as you go through everything. So this result, um, you know, kind of, uh, we were disappointed. We were hoping that it would be polynomial time, actually. And, uh, but, you know, what we did is uh, we said, okay, well, so De Bruyne graphs didn't work out. Let's look at string graphs, which is the second formulation for compressing repeats. And the motivation for string graphs when Gene Myers built them in sort of 2005 were the problems with the De Bruyne approach. So the division into Kamer's arbitrary. Uh, it's, uh, it's also very sensitive to sequencing errors. So when you have a one letter change, just by mistake, the, the sequencing machinery went, uh, went, went you know, wrong somewhere and told you that there's a C somewhere, but while there should be a T, well, that'll correspond to two sort of different paths on the De Bruyne graph. They will separate for some time, then they will rejoin. And you can think of that searching for these things on the graph is going to be difficult. And that third problem is this is not memory efficient. You need one node per kamer. But uh, you, what you would like is you want one node per read, per actual sequence, no division into kamers, flexibility in the presence of sequencing errors, while the repeats are still collapsed. So the whole thing of De Bruyne graphs, if you have some string present multiple times, it's the same path of kamers. Gene wanted to have the same thing for string graphs. So this is how you build a string graph. First, you find the overlaps between the reads. So this is read one, this is read two, and this is how they somehow overlap. And you allow for mismatches in there and uh, for insertions, deletions, things like that. You model that as an edge, same as in the old uh, overlap graph approach. However, when you have uh, lots of these now, so these are lots of reads, and we'll worry about directionality later first, but um, you get this kind of graph. And these red edges, while they're present, they're actually inferable from the black edges. So any path which uses the red edge, you can just go through here. So what you do is you remove these transitively infer inferable overlaps and get a graph which looks like this. So it's nice and linear. And finally, you collapse chains. So this becomes all a single edge. And if your uh, chain had any internal vertices, it's a required edge. You have to visit it because there is, because uh, otherwise you basically have not explained some read in your assembly. And if a edge didn't have any internal vertices, it's an optional edge, which means that you don't have to visit it. It's just there for your convenience if you wish. So the goal of uh, Gene Myers' formulation was to find the shortest path using all of the required edges and any optional ones that you want, but not necessarily all of them. Well, uh, it turns out that this is also NP-hard. <laughs> Again, very disappointing. But uh, this is actually even a simpler reduction, where if all edges are required, th actually, this is polytime. So there was some hope initially. If all edges are required, this is actually a Chinese postman problem. But with optional edges, you have a very simple reduction from Hamiltonian path. Take a graph, make required edges at every node, make all of the other edges optional, 
And if you have a path of length 2n, a cover of length 2n here, that's exactly a Hamiltonian path here. You know, very simple reduction. So I guess the conclusion of this portion is we've demonstrated that both, uh, I mean, it's uh, both of these, there are really no other methods for graph theoretic models for sequence assembly are also NP-hard. But once we did it, so sort of, you know, we were really disappointed. We actually, in, in my group, we like to build things and not to show that they're difficult. Uh, so the question was, can we combine them to do something easy? And it turned out, well, yeah, kind of. So let's go back to this Chinese postman problem. The Chinese postman problem is to find a uh, walk on the graph which uses every edge at least once and possibly uses uh, some edges multiple times and the shortest such walk. So uh, if, you have an, if the graph is Eulerian, right, if there is an Eulerian tour in the graph, this is a poly, this is, you know, it, it is a solution. The Eulerian tour is a solution. It uses every single edge and it's minimal. Well, then there is the process of Eulerization. What if it's not Eulerian? Then you can make it Eulerian. You can do it with minimum cost flow. You uh, find the nodes which are unbalanced. So remember, Eulerian, Eulerian tour, it exists if all your nodes are balanced, same in degree as out degree. So here I have two unbalanced nodes. I, what I do is I find the minimum cost flow from here to there and duplicate those edges making the graph now balanced. And um, what the result is, is now an Eulerian graph, and it's a pretty simple proof to show that this is a uh, smallest number of edges that can be added to the graph to make it Eulerian and to have a Chinese postman tour. However, one problem was that uh, with Pevsner's result is that DNA is not a string. Remember, we've just been saying, oh, it's just a string, overlaps, no. It's a molecule. So when you have this string, A-T-T-G-C-C-A-A-C, -A -A you have this path, but there's also that. The same string, the reverse complement of the string. So A-T-T, it's A-A-T, and so on. And it's right in this direction. So instead of this set of k-mers, you get this. So for each one of them, you also get its reverse complement. And instead of this nice little graph in which there is only one path, you get something which looks like this. And the goal is not a Chinese postman tour, but a separation into two Chinese postman tours, which are reverse complements of each other. And Pevsner, uh, in 1989, uh, basically said, ah, just throw it in and we'll use some heuristics to sort it all out. And uh, I have spoken to him and he said, well, he doesn't think that this problem is polynomial time. Well, it turns out it is. However, we had to bring in something from the work of Gene Myers, which was bidirected string graphs. So remember, DNA is double-stranded, and the strand selection was unknown. So what Gene did, or actually what somebody else did and then Gene took up, is to model overlaps between reads using something called bidirected edges. So in a bidirected edge, you have a directionality at each of the, at each of the ends of the edge. So, if you have two reads overlapping like this, well, it looks like a regular edge. But if you have two reads which overlap sort of tail to tail, the edge also points out at both directions. And when two reads overlap at the insides, they both the two edges point in. And um, so uh, this leads to uh, bidirected graphs, sort of the overlap graph becomes bidirected. And the only requirement that we have on the walk is that it match directions at the node. So let's take a look at this node X. When you walk through it, you can come in on an in arrow, then you have to leave on an out arrow. So you go from here, out like this. You can also actually come in on this arrow, on the B arrow, and then you can leave on an A arrow. You can go backwards. As long, the only rule is you have to match directions. And uh, so this graph, although it does have a Chinese postman tour, and it actually looks something like this. You can start at Z, go to X. From X, you actually have only one choice. You have to go to B because you have to match the arrows. You get to Y. Now you have to spin. 
then you have to go, oh, this actually, yes, that's fine. You have to spin around. Now you have to go backwards through B. Now you can go to X, uh, through X to A, to W, back around to X. But here you can't just pop out onto Z. You have to spin around one more time and then come out. So this bidirected graph, you can visit all of the edges within, without uh, going back. Can't you go to Z? No, because you see that the directions of the arrows are un unmatched. Yeah, so you have to, if you come in on an in, you have to leave on an out. You come in on an out, you have to leave on an in. But uh, you can't mix them. So what uh, Kichicheo glue in 91 and Myers took off this up in 95 and 2005, notice that this exactly corresponds to overlaps between DNA strings. And this corresponds to sort of using a molecule on the one strand if you come in on an in and leave on an out. And if you do it the other way, then it corresponds to the other strand of the same molecule. So this work, so this sort of, what we did is we just generalized this work to a bidirected De Bruyne graph. So each node now corresponds to a K molecule. So it has CA on one strand and TG on the other. Edge orientations correspond to strands. So if you come in and leave on, uh, come in on an in and leave on an out, that's the plus strand, that's CA. And if you come in on an out and leave on the in, that's the minus strand, TG. And a path can use a node in both orientations. So for example, this is sort of a made up example, but this corresponds to CA, AT, so CAT, then to T and G. GC and so on. You can sp keep on spinning in here for as long as you want. So, and this will use the nodes in both orientations. So, however, what, a, what is the complexity of the Chinese Postman problem in bidirected graphs? So, we took a, started looking through literature and we found that Chinese Postman problem in undirected graphs is polynomial time and is actually equivalent to regular matching uh, in a graph. In a directed graph, also polynomial time. And it's equivalent to network flow. Mixed graphs, so those are graphs where you have both directed edges and undirected edges. It actually becomes NP-hard. For bidirected, there's no literature. But it's kind of equivalent to bidirected flow the same way as direct is equivalent to regular network flow. And uh, now, at this point, we use the resource, a computational technique which was not available to Kechecheoglu back in 91 when he developed bidirected graphs, and we used Google. <laughs> so the computational technique via Google uh, revealed that uh, bidirected graphs were known earlier than Kechecheoglu, who did found, discovered them in 1991. They were actually known back in 1967 in the classic work by Jack Edmonds. And they were sort of further extended by Gabo in 83. So the flow in the bidirected graph is actually equivalent to something called B matchings. And those are matchings where you have a number, B, attached to every vertex, and you allow it to be matched up to B times. And you can use edges multiple times in the matching. And so bidirected flows are the same equivalent to B matching, the same way as network flows is equivalent to matching in the, bi, in the bipartite graph. So in 1967, Edmonds showed a polynomial time algorithm. And uh, Gabo's 1983 result, he gave an E squared log squared V time, which in our case becomes just V squared because our graph is sparse. Every node has at most four edges incident on it, or the size of the alphabet edges incident on it. So this, we can now go from this graph, and the, this we can solve the Chinese Postman tour. And this automatically gives us a solution to Pevsner's problem, because there are two tours of this graph. You can go through like this. Or you can go through like this, just the same path but backwards. And they exactly spell the reverse complements of each other. And if you just take the mirror image, you get the polynomial time algorithm for separation into the two strands. So just sort of to give you a feel, some open problems remain. 
So one problem, which is actually equivalent to an open problem which has been open for 20 years, is there a Chinese super walk? Sorry, no, is this one. Is there a Chinese tour of a particular length? So that is a um, problem is difficult because you can think of the numbers as written in unary because every edge has length exactly one. If all of the if edges had distances and they were written in binary, it would be NP-complete. Another open problem, is there a Chinese superwalk that uses every edge a given number of times? So we said earlier that if every edge is used once, the problem is polynomial time. Well, what if God came down and told us, you have to use this edge 25 times and this edge 17 times? Is there then a Chinese postman tour? So that's an uh, open problem. And one problem which remains open, is there a polynomial time model for genome assembly? And that's uh, sort of still quite open because, so usually people say genome assembly is NP-complete. Well, no, what they mean is not genome assembly is NP-complete, but the X model of genome assembly is NP-complete. Genome assembly is not a theoretical problem. So this is what we're actually most interested in, uh, and we're trying to figure out if we can find something which is a mix of the two. So uh, I'm now going to completely, completely, completely switch gears and talk about things which have absolutely nothing to do with biology. And uh, now we actually you know, get to building things. So this is a project uh, on virtual machines to enable bioinformatics computation, or at least that's what I tell uh, the people in the medical school who I work with who are like, why are you working on this? Uh, but it's actually, you can use it for any kind of parallelizable computation. And so just, I'm assuming most people here actually know a lot about virtual machines, just, but just as a very brief overview, a virtual machine, you can think of it as a computer running inside another computer. It has, it looks, it's, as far as the operating system inside knows, it is the only operating system around. It does everything as though it's uh, the boss, but in reality there's something which is running outside of it, which is the hypervisor and keeps track of all of these virtual machines. It can be suspended, moved to another computer, restarted there. This is called migration. So here you can think of you have a, something which is running. You can think of it, I like to think of it in terms of my laptop. I can, if I'm doing something on my laptop and I need sort of a fast connection to the internet and at home my connection is slow, I can close my laptop, carry it with me to the lab, plug it into the network, open it up, and it'll be in the exact same state in which I left it. So. It can be, uh, so this is called migration when you do it with just a virtual machine. Another nice thing is we can run several virtual machines on a single physical machine. And they will all be oblivious about the existence of each other, unless we sort of have them talk to each other in some way. And they have already been used for quite a few things. So adding security, migration of processes, creating a ubiquitous environment. So, you know, you can think of, you can have your VM on a USB key. You show up to a machine, you open it, stick your USB key in, and it just boots up in whatever state you, lift, you, you left it. You'd need, given that it's the size of USBs, you'd need a very small machine, but uh, this can be done. So our project, which started out as Snowbird by some colleagues of mine, and we now call it Snowflock, is uh, the idea that a machine should really be computing where it makes the most sense to do computation. So, if you're sitting, if you're doing some, you know, high-end graphics, such as playing Doom, you probably don't want to be playing on the remote machine and getting your Doom connection through X. Uh, if you're computing over a large data set, you probably don't want it to be local because that data set may not fit in your hard disk or maybe you have to download that data set. And actually, one of the main points is that machines are smaller than data sets. If you think about sort of the typical Windows or anything else installed, that'll be usually much smaller than the size of all of the data that you're computing over in a typical scientific application. And what's not a nice thing, they can provide for efficient shared usage of large compute and data resources. So I have a cluster, and uh, I want to allow another biological researcher uh, to do some computation. I can just give them an account. But then if the user screws up, if they have, for example, a bad password, somebody hacks their account, once they're inside, they can actually, it's much easier for them to hack the whole system and so on. So if you have a virtual machine, if they get hacked, I'm not going to get hacked. So 
to all together, it gives you a powerful but yet secure computing environment. You can do anything because you have an operating system, but you, uh, cannot, uh, but you cannot get hacked as easily. So here is sort of an overview of, this, of the project. We have remote users, and uh, we have our cluster. A remote user has a machine, which they're running, and they want to migrate the machine to our cluster. Once it's at our cluster, we will allow them to fork copies of their machine. So they had one copy, and now they have multiple. All of the two users both migrate their machines over. Some of the cluster nodes will have machines from both users. Other cluster nodes will have machines from only one user. And they can all communicate. They basically get a virtual network using all these nodes, but they cannot see each other. The blue, no, the blue user is oblivious to the existence of the red user, and so on. So how do we actually accomplish this? So what is the life cycle? The machine is initialized somewhere remotely. It will migrate to a computer data resource, and then it will fork clones to allow for parallel computation. So this will give you many machines, collect results, and migrate back. And the way this is actually accomplished is uh, using pretty much existing technology. So here is a user. He's sitting. He has his master node, which he's interested in. It's connected to something called one disk, which is wide area network disk, and uh, which is actually connected to the physical disk image. And then there's Snowflock. It's our tool, which is running inside the DOM0. This is the hypervisor, the supervisor of the machine. Um, which is running. And this is the user space, so here are all of the, sort of all of the machines will run. And this is our cluster. It also is running Snowflock. So when they want to uh, do some serious computation, what they do is they request of Snowflock uh, that they migrate over to us. That sends a request through the internet across to the cluster. And a virtual private network is established between the user and our, our cluster. So now all of the connections will happen through that. The master node is then migrated. And uh, it's a request, again, the request to migration, the actual migration call. The machine is migrated across the VPN. And this is included. So Zen is a popular hypervisor open source. And, um, yeah, it already includes all the facilities for migration across a local network. And basically, a VPN gives us the ability to do it using all existing tools. And once the machine is migrated, Snowflock will send information about how this machine should be configured, where its disk is, and so on. And the actual disk, the way it's connected, it's going to be this one disk here, which is connected to the one disk here. So we will not actually move the whole disk across. This is, could be gigabytes across a possibly slow connection. We will actually do the disk fetches on request. So the nice thing about this is all network connections stay alive. If the user has an SSH connection open to this machine, that will stay alive once the machine is migrated. It will, uh, it will not die. Once the, machine, once the machine is over on our side, it can ask for clones. Once it, it makes the request to Snowflock, the machine is saved and sent across to, the, uh, to, the, to another node. And uh, copies are started. The copies will point back to this one disk located on the DOM0 on the user side. And um, that, those will point back to the one disk. And the way one disk is actually works, it's a uh, very simple copy on write and copy on read system. If you're within a physical machine, you're doing copy on write only. So when you make a write, you will write a new copy. When you make a read, you will request a uh, copy of somewhere else, and then you'll just get the value. If it's between two physical machines, we'll actually save a copy on every read as well. So uh, very simple to get. So this is level, works on the level of disk blocks, and uh, it turns out to be very efficient. Finally, once the node has done its computation, it will need to uh, clean up. And uh, the way that works is, again, you send a re cleanup request that gets forwarded. The slave nodes are just killed off. There's nothing which needs to be done for them. They disappear. Then the master will migrate back to the client. The disk, with any changes which have been done to the disk, will be merged back. And 
the network will disappear. One thing that uh, you know, still remains is how do we handle the situation of multiple users? So the two users are both on our physical cluster. We need them to be able to talk between machines on their network, but not see the other, physical, the other virtual machines which are around. And then we actually use something, a very elegant solution uh, at the level of, um, uh, at the ethernet level, rather than the IP level. So what we do is we put a little box at the virtual NIC. So any connection, any packets which are going into the client virtual machines have to go through that box, and we provide that. And what that does is it looks at every single Ethernet packet which is coming in and rewrites it or decides whether it should be accepted or not. So if you have a packet which is coming in, it uh, looks at the source. And if that's a, a node which is on the same virtual cluster, then you allow it through, and you actually rewrite the destination to the MAC address of the client virtual machine. So the address which all of the other machines used to refer to it, to the machine, is this one. But the machine itself thinks it has this MAC address, so you just change it so that the machine will accept the packet. If, however, the source is not something which we know, so dead beef, then we just throw the packet. And the same thing happens on ascending. You check the destination and filter the packets appropriately. So this uh, allows you to completely, uh, you know, cleanly handle the networking problem at the level at which the machines which are running don't even know that anything like this exists. So I guess, what's the overhead? Is this going to be a heavyweight solution which will be impossible to run anywhere? Well, first of all, virtual machine overhead. So we took a popular bioinformatics package, BLAST, and ran it on a virtual machine versus a real machine. Just this is sort of simple validation that we can get, still get work done. And it turns out there is a 4.8% overhead, which is sort of insignificant from our perspective. OK, what about the time it takes to clone a machine? You have a machine running. Now you want to have a copy of it running somewhere else. So within 13 seconds of the issue of a, of a um, clone instruction, the master is running again. So any network connections to the master, everything else is going to stay alive. 13 seconds is an insufficient timeout for, for the network connection and everything else to die. And the clone on a different machine is running within 25 seconds. So just as a comparison, copying a file, a one gigabyte file, at the same uh, across between these two machines takes 23 seconds. So, you know, we're pretty much maxing out the network. And the disk fact fetching, well, it turns out that on boot up, so when you start a virtual machine using one disk, it requires, it reads an, another 12K of uh, disk. And uh, post blast, it's 15. And the written stuff is also insignificant. So, the networking overhead. There's actually no slowdown because the CPU is much, and which, which does the rewriting is much faster than the network. The CPU overhead, when you're transmitting, it goes from 30% CPU usage to 36%, and when receiving from 50%, from 47% to 49.5%. So again, slight overhead in terms of CPU and almost no overhead in terms of the actual time it takes to send a file to receive a file. So we're sort of, the Snowflock work is very much still in development. We're finishing the implementation of a prototype and we're going to release it open source and all the good stuff. We're evaluating disk multiplexing. So for now, every single client which comes up, it has to request the disk. But it would be much more efficient to just multiplex the disk out to all the clients and use the actual switches to uh, get all the improvements instead of uh, having their the independent fetches. We're considering API extensions, so you know, just as we have can fork virtual machines now, we want to consider, do we want to have a join call as well? And uh, what exactly would that mean in the VM scenario? We're looking a little bit at scheduling. A lot of work has been done on this and other policy-related issues, but uh, we're probably just going to get something off the market, off, off the shelf for this. And finally, we want to create a BioFlock installation and service. So basically, biologists will be able to do remote computations on their data resource, which is provided for them, rather than having to download all the data, keep local copies, and so on. OK, well, 
with that, I want to thank all of my colleagues. So the assembly work I talked about was done by, mainly by Paul Medvedev, who is a grad student at the University of Toronto, and also Konstantinos Georgiou, and also Gene Myers uh, at Genelia Farms worked with us. On the virtual clusters, it's a collaboration between uh, my group and Eyal Delara's group, uh, with Joe Whitney, Andres uh, Cavilla, and Steve Rumble con con contributing a lot of work, and Ryan Lilly, another colleague in the CS department, another PI. And this stuff I actually didn't talk about, so I'm not going to thank those people. Well, I'll thank those people, but not now. And um, the funding was provided by um, NSERC, which is a Canadian NSF, and CFI, which has no equivalence in the US lingo. So, and thank you all for listening. part of your talk. <laughs> for, for the first, you mentioned that uh, the major problem for assembly is that you have repetitions. Now, I wasn't following exactly the details of the modifications you presented later, but it seems to me that doubtful that any, any of them, or almost anything, can handle repetitions unless you uh, insert some extra data about counting how many you have. Is that correct? Uh, not quite. Here, let me show you. Yeah, so uh, the question is about repetitions in uh, the genome and how you can figure out that there are repetitions without actually looking at the data. So here is, let, once I go back far enough. Let me go, let's, I guess it's, it's easiest to show on this uh, slide. So take a look at this graph. So let's say this edge was required because there was some internal vertex. And this edge was also required. This would, just from the structure of the graph, you would now be able to figure out that all of these nodes have to be used twice and then split at some point over there. So with no additional data, actually, you can figure out that this chain is used twice in the genome. Yeah. Uh, more than that. So twice, OK. Uh, three times, OK. So you know, it's, once you get to a million times, you're basically, it's hopeless. I will agree with you that it's going to be very, very difficult. You will get some overcompression. But the problem with the shortest common superstring approach is even things which are present twice in the genome are, would be compressed. The other thing which helps us from a practical standpoint is that things which are present twice could be very long. Things which are present a million times typically are very short. And hopefully, we have a full read which spans the whole thing so that we have some unique stuff before and some unique stuff after, which will help us figure out how many ways there are through it. So you can use the unique parts in order to help you figure out the uh, parts which are, which are common, which, which have multiple copies. You, usually, when, when you simulate one machine with another, you're using a lock instead of a single instruction. You have two, three, who knows? Uh, while uh, in, in, in your case, you say it's only a, a few percent. So, uh, what's the reason? Like, well, so uh, I am actually, so I'm not the biggest expert on how un the underlying virtual machines work, but Basically, it's the, the, the way a virtual machine is different from, a, um, uh, from just having a machine run inside an application is that all of the instructions run maximally close to the hardware. So when the virtual machine executes the instruction, it has to be in the same architecture that the hard underlying, underlying hardware understands. And the instruction is directly sent to the hardware. You don't need to translate the instruction. Like It's not like a... Uh, Intel chip uh, and a uh, power PC chip. That the, the hardware is the same. The instruction can just be directly taken from the virtual machine and put in the hardware. So the overhead as a result is very, very small. So the, the virtual thing actually gets full control. It's running its own instructions one after the other. It gets full control of its own instructions. It, the hypervisor basically, I think you can think of it as a parallelization. Like, you can have multiple threads running within the same operating system or multiple processes. 
it's similar that uh, to some extent you can think of it as just a, a virtual machine as just a process on the hypervisor. Um, what is junk DNA? What is junk DNA? Uh, I, I don't think I use that term, <laughs> but junk DNA, uh, people refer to junk DNA as pieces of DNA which they don't understand. <laughs> That's the simplest answer. Uh, if you don't understand it, it's junk. And then it, uh, there is papers published like finding jewels in junk DNA, which are finding things which actually do stuff among the things which you didn't do, think did anything. I was hoping maybe you could optimize this by ignoring the junk DNA in the beginning. Uh, junk, you don't know it's junk. Junk DNA are part of the genome. You cannot <laughs> assemble the parts of the genome which are just not junk. If you're either getting the whole genome or you know, you're not. And like, for example, these repeats, the ALU repeats I mentioned, a million copies, people think they're junk, but that's mainly because we don't understand what it is they're doing. And we've studied them for however many, 10 years, and we still don't know what they do. So maybe they're junk, but who knows? Um, how does the, length, the average length of the reads affect your timing? But if they're longer, does it help? Or so uh, the question is whether the length of the read helps. And it certainly, it, the length of the read if you had the, the length of the read be the size of the genome, it would be a trivial problem. Uh, so it's, a, uh, it's actually a very interesting problem because what this shows is that, so what this result showed was that if your reads were all length three, we could have an algorithm. But the question is, would it give you the correct solution? And uh, from an algorithmic perspective, shorter reads make things easier. But from a practical perspective, you will get the same over collapse of areas which you don't understand. So you need your read basically to be longer than the length of your repeats. And if the, if the length of your read is bigger than the length of the repeats, uh, it's a simple solution, a simple problem. The problem is that it's a trade off. So you can get really short reads really cheaply and lots of them. Long reads are expensive to get and you get fewer. All right, thank you.